morning, everybody. My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs, and today I want to talk to you about serving, servanthood, developing the heart of a servant. We've been through the last uh, few weeks, we've been talking about baggage, and we've asked God to help us to rid us of baggage so that we can learn to live free and travel light. And so, and so listen, the next part of that, the next step of that is not to live our lives selfishly, but to live our lives generously in a way that impacts the people and the world around us. So we're not free to do whatever we want to. We're not free to live selfishly or sinfully. We are free in order to serve. Amen? Okay, so this is what we're going to talk to you, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about in the next few moments. But I, I don't know about you, but I was thinking about this this week, and, and my experience is, is this. I can drift away pretty quickly. From, in, my, in my heart, I can drift away from having a servant's heart. Like I can be the nicest, the kindest, the most generous person in the world, and, and I can go from that to somewhat of a selfish, self-centered jerk in the matter of seconds, really. It can go that fast, or it can be like a subtle drift. I mean, I can become stingy, greedy. I know none of, none of you can relate to this at all, but I'm just telling you about myself. I can drift towards selfishness, and I can drift towards wanting to serve nobody but me. I don't know if you can relate to that at all, but uh, I heard a funny story, and it kind of illustrated this a little bit. Let me tell it to you, okay? There was a man who went to the doctor after having several weeks of symptoms of something wrong in his body, and his doctor examined him carefully and then called the patient's wife into his, his office, and he told the wife, your husband is suffering from a rare form of anemia. And without treatment, he'll, he'll, he's going to pass away within weeks. But the good news is it can be treated with proper nutrition. So the doctor told the wife, you're going to need to get up very early in the morning and fix your husband a hot breakfast and pancakes and, ba and bacon and eggs and the whole works. And he'll need a home-cooked lunch every single day. And then an old-fashioned meat and potato dinner every single night. And it would especially be helpful if you could bake frequently. Bake because cakes and pies and homemade treats and breads and all these things will allow your husband to stay alive. He needs this. And one more thing, his immune system is really weak. And so it's important that your home be kept spotless at all times. <laughs> And, and the doctor said, do you have any questions? <laughs> and the, wife's, the wife had none. And so, uh, do, do you, do you want to break the news or shall I? The doctor asked the wife. And the wife replied, I'll do it. <clears throat> and so she walked into the exam room, the husband sensing the seriousness of this illness. And, and he asked her, it, is it, it's bad, isn't it? It's bad news. And, and she nodded and tears welled up in her eyes. And, and he said, what's going to happen to me? The, and and uh, with a sob, the wife just blurted out, the doctor says you're going to die. <laughs> it's not always fun to serve. It's not always fun to sacrifice. To give of yourself for the, say, for the benefit of somebody else, right? Okay, go ahead and grab your message notes if you want to follow along. Take notes with me uh, the next few minutes. But we're going to ask God to help us with our hearts today. And honestly, I'm probably preaching to the choir this morning because you guys are some of the most generous, uh, servant-hearted people that I, that I know, and I'm blessed to serve here as your pastor, but just as a, as a reminder how important to have a servant's heart is, let's study the scriptures together, okay? John chapter 13, um, <clears throat> this is one of the most powerful uh, moments in, uh, in the story of Jesus. In John chapter 13, we'll start in verse uh, 1, we'll 
talk about uh, all the way up to about 17. But it says this. It was just before the Passover feast. Okay, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. So this is just before um, Good Friday. This is just before uh, Jesus is betrayed and go, go, goes to the cross to give up his life for our sins. This is just before that. But Jesus was, was fully aware of what was coming his way, right? He knew, he knew the, the betrayal from Judas was on the way. He knew the beating, the whipping, the torture of the cross. He knew, he knew it was really, really imminent. It was really close to, to happening. Yet, in this moment, what's amazing is what we're going to see here in just a minute, that Jesus was, was not just thinking about himself. He was not just focused on himself. He wasn't focused on his needs. Rather, he was focused, as we're going to see in the scripture a little, in just a moment, he was focused on the needs of others, the needs of his disciples specifically. Listen, like, I'm amazed when I, when I read stories like this because, for example, if I, if I was in this place and I knew I was about to have a bad day the next day, I knew that it was just going to be a really, really hard day. I mean, the day before, I would have planned it out perfectly. Like, the, like I would have been thinking to myself, what? I'm about to go through a hard day. I'm going to plan of the day before. It's just going to be all about me. Okay, so I thought about what I would do. I would begin the day by sleeping in. Okay, I would sleep in. Anybody like to sleep in? Okay, um, that's great. Don't do it on Sundays, though. Okay, so next, I'd, I'd, I'd go to breakfast at Cracker Barrel. All right, anybody like Cracker Barrel? Okay, I do too. Uh, I would go get a massage. I would, I would have some quiet time to read a relaxing book without the kids around. Somebody say amen to that. Maybe I'd play a uh, video game or two. Uh, maybe I'd go to Chick-fil-A for lunch. Okay, I'm just telling you what the perfect day for me would be. All right, then after that, I'd go home and take a nap. After that, I'd go to the lake, do a little fishing. And um, then I'd go home and eat Chinese food for dinner. Okay? <clears throat> I may look white on the outside, but I can, t I can assure you I am Asian on the inside. I love some Chinese food, okay? So uh, after that, I'd go home, watch a couple episodes of the Andy Griffith Show, um, and then I'd go to bed early as Ashley rubs my feet with some essential oils. Um, <clears throat> Then I'd wake up rested and renewed for my very hard day that was coming up. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. He wasn't concerned so much about himself. He was concerned about the people around him. Look at this next verse. It says this, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now, look at this, he now showed them the full extent of, of his love. Jesus knew that this was a moment, this is an opportunity not just to, to have love, but to show love. It's great to say, I love you. It's even greater, like to have all the emotions of love. But what, but what real love is, it's, it's always a love that is shown. It's, it, real love is a love that is expressed. Real love is a love that is demonstrated in a practical way. And Jesus says, I'm going to focus on your needs. And I'm going to show you the extent of my love for you. So at this Passover meal, uh, their, their table, if you look back on how, how they ate at that time, their table was probably about like three inches off the ground. Okay, And you probably read in the scripture that there is this like reclining at the table. They would kind of lay down, lay, lay down on their side like they were already getting ready for a nap after dinner. I don't know. But they would like recline down um, all together around this table that was very, very low. And the only problem with this kind of arrangement is what I call the smelly feet problem. Okay? The problem is that your feet might try to get up in somebody else's business during this special kind of meal. 
And so back in that day, you would, you would have had a, a special person designated to be a foot washer, okay? Um, but thank God for shoes and tables and chairs that we have today, right? Okay, but apparently at this particular meal that they were at, nobody had arranged for there to be a foot washer guy. Uh, I mean, this, this job was the job that nobody really wanted, it was the, the lowest of the low job. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like, a, like a, uh, uh, the worst job you could, that you could have at a gathering like this. Um, and there would have been tension in the room about this. Like these guys looking around like our feet are all dirty. Our feet are all smelly and we're going we're gonna to eat together like this. Uh, what's going on? So there's probably tension in the room. Um, but, but they just go on and they start... They start even politicking with each other. They're saying, who's going to be in charge of Jesus' new kingdom? Because they still didn't really understand that Jesus' kingdom was going to be a spiritual kingdom and not, and not an uh, earthly one. Um, but they were, and they were arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom and all of these things. And Judas is about to betray Jesus. And Jesus, I mean, Peter is going to deny Jesus and all these guys just turned into all things selfish. And Jesus knew it all, even before it took, it took place. But Jesus, in this moment, in this story, he does the unthinkable. He walks over, he takes his outer garment off, as the scripture says, and he puts on a towel around his waist, and he gets that foot washing bowl out and he begins to wash the disciples feet now jesus was was the last person who should have been doing this job jesus especially knowing what was coming for him the next day in fact peter even said you cannot do this to me and jesus said if i don't wash your feet you can have no part with me. And Jesus was showing Peter and everyone else that this is what I'm all about. Jesus was saying, I am here to serve. I am a servant. I'm not here to be served. Rather, I am here to serve you. <clears throat> Let's keep reading in the scripture. It says, Jesus said this, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash the feet of one another. And I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now think about this. If Jesus, if Jesus wasn't too good to serve other people, then we shouldn't be either. Right? So Jesus set the example, and it wasn't just about this one-time event of washing his feet. Now, Jesus was setting the example, and it was like he was saying, everyone who is called by my name, everyone who names themselves a Christian, you should be learning from my example, and you should be serving one another. In essence, Jesus is saying, is saying this, if you're going to follow me, I want you to do what I do. If you're going to follow me, and, 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 and listen, the very heart of what Jesus does is serving. This is his heart. He says, I serve with my whole heart. He serves with everything within him. He, he looks for needs and he meets them. He serves willingly. He serves humbly. He serves sacrificially. He serves joyfully. But if you are going to follow after Jesus, you have to learn to serve. And you have to learn to have a servant's heart. Now, Jesus follows this up with a powerful statement. He says, now that you know these things, you will be what? You will be blessed if you actually do them, right? The power is in putting these things to practice because sometimes the greatest distance in the world is here to here. We can know to do things, but if we don't actually do them, we, we lose the impact. We lose the power. The power, my friends, 
is in the application of the word. Okay, so you've, re- you've really never lived your life until you've lived your life in such a way that makes an impact, an eternal impact, a positive, godly impact on the lives of other people. And Jesus teaches us one of the most important concepts of the entire Bible and the entire New Testament. It's, it's really simple. It's this. Christians serve. Christians give of themselves. Christians think of others, not just themselves. Amen? Amen. So um, let me take a side here and just tell you, I have an agenda today, okay? Sometimes you hear, you hear preachers and they, they have an agenda, but they don't tell you until the end. Well, I'm just going to tell you like right here at the beginning, I have an agenda today, okay? You ready for it? I want to tell you, I want you to join our dream team and to begin serving with our church. If you call this church your home, I want you to begin thinking about and praying about serving in some capacity. Why? Number one, I'm just sharing with you from my my heart for just a second. Number one is this, because Jesus calls all, all of us, each of us, to be servants to have servants' hearts, and to make a difference in the lives of other people. Number two is this. We just had a meeting uh, yesterday with all of our team leaders and all of our staff, and we really feel like God is leading us soon to add, listen, to add a second Sunday morning service. Okay, now think about this, because in here we see some empty seats. But if you were to go into our kids' rooms you would see that they are beyond capacity, especially when everybody shows up and all the kids come in. They're, they, we are full in the kids' space. And our kids' rooms are just busting at the seams and they're filling up pretty quickly. And we want to be able to add a second service with kids' ministry and everything so that individuals and families of our community would have an opportunity to hear the gospel to get plugged into a life-giving church, and it's absolutely, without a doubt, our next growth step as a church, okay? I want you to hear that loud and clear, okay? This is, without a doubt, soon, adding a second service is our next growth step as a church, and if we, if we don't do it relatively soon, what will happen is, and I just got to tell you this, we will cap our growth. Okay, so we have to do it soon. Okay, so I want you to understand this because here's the thing. And here's what I want you to hear uh, from my heart this morning is this. In order to make this happen, we need more willing servants. We need more people uh, to join our dream team. We need more people to say, yes, Lord, I will serve. I will serve our kids I will serve on the worship team. I will serve in the back on our production team. I will serve on the prayer team. I will serve in the hospitality team. Yes, Lord, count me in. I will serve however you want me to, okay? So we know that there's a need, and I'm calling you to think about it and to begin praying about where you might want to serve, okay, to take to help take our church to the next level and to see God continue to do awesome things in and through our church. But you might say, but Pastor Brian, I got a lot of questions about this. I don't know what serving entails. What would, what would I be getting myself into? Uh, what would be expected of me? Are you going to throw me into the wolves? I mean, what's going to happen to me, okay? Can old people serve? Can young people serve? Can people all of ages and, and backgrounds serve? These are really, really great questions. So what we're going to do is over the next few weeks, we're going to take time during each service, and we're going to talk about and just explain some of our most pressing serving opportunities and needs. And we're going to go in detail and provide you the education that you need about each of those things. Okay? But your very first step, okay? Jot this down if you're taking notes. Your very first step, if you're interested at all about learning how to serve in our church and be a part of what God is doing, is this. We want you to attend the growth track. 
okay? I want you to attend the growth track. Write that down. This Thursday, we're going to be doing Church 101. How many of you guys want to see the kingdom of God advance in this community, in this world? How many of you want to actually be a part of that? If we, want to, we want to get plugged in. We want to be involved in this. And the way that you can be involved in it is to attend our growth track. And we just ask everyone who, uh, who serves with us to attend this growth track because we want you to know our heartbeat as a church. We want to set you up for success in your service. So if you would take four weeks out beginning this week, this Thursday, and say, yeah, I'm going to attend the growth track because I want to serve and I want to be a part of the kingdom of God advancing in this community. And I want to help the Springs Church grow because I believe in the mission and vision of this church. Then I want, to, I want you to do this. Make a commitment right now. To think about, to pray about it, and to attend the growth track coming up. Amen? Okay. So who, his, who is a servant? By the way, thank you for allowing me to share, share my heart with you about that. But let's continue to study the scripture and think about who is a servant. Okay? What does the Bible say? The, the word servant is mentioned uh, hundreds of times in the scripture. And there are seven Greek words that are in the New Testament for this one word, servant or ser or serving. Uh, and I'm not going to give you all seven of these words today, but I want to give you three. Okay. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. Uh, the first one is called doulos. Doulos. And this literally means a bond servant. A bond servant. Some translations of the Bible call, use the word slave in reference to this kind of uh, servant, but it, it denotes the meaning that is somebody who has voluntarily given a, a is said, said, I will voluntarily be a lifelong servant to you, a bond servant. It's used in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. It says this, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last, and the Doulos of all, the servant of all. The principle here that I want you to see is this, is this refers to a lifelong commitment. This is a word that, that teaches us this is, a li this is a serious thing. This is not just a passing momentary thing, but this is a lifetime commitment to serve. Okay. The second word I want to show it to you is this, is uh, dia. Konos. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of that, but it literally means the deacon. Okay, the Bible talks about the word diakonos, meaning deacon. And the best way to understand the word deacon is like it's it's a uh, like a waiter at a restaurant. Okay, and a very attentive, a very good waiter. And what is, what does a good waiter do? He'll be very attentive to the needs of his or her customers. Right. If you need water, here's your water. If you need more bread, here's your more bread. We're very attentive and focused on the needs of others. And when the Bible talks about that, that's the servant heartedness that the Bible says needs to be a part of our deacons, a part of our lives. And uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse uh, 26 through 28 says, uses this word, and it says this, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your Diakonos, your servant. And whoever wants to be first <clears throat> must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the principle with this word is this. We're just focused on the needs of other people. Okay, jot that down if you're taking notes with me. If you're not taking notes, jot that down anyway. Um, <clears throat> the principle is focused on the needs of others, okay? So I want to just invite everybody to raise your, raise your right hand with me, okay? Raise your right hand, and I hereby deputize all of you to be deacons of the Springs Church. Okay, you can put your hands down. You're now deacons. Okay, third, third word is this. This is a Greek word, all right? Hep, heparites, 
probably butchered that again, but uh, bear with me. Let me say it correctly. Huperetes. Huperetes. It literally means this uh, concept of being an under rower. I'll explain that in just a minute, but write that down now. Uh, an under rower. In Acts chapter 26, it uses this word. It says this. Uh, this is actually Paul quoting Jesus in this verse. It says, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you and uh, to appoint you as a huperetes, a servant, and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Now, think about this, this term under, under rower. Now, you, have you ever seen the movie uh, uh, Ben Hur? It's like a, it's an old old movie. So if you ever have like ten hours, you can go watch that movie. Okay, it's really long, uh, but oh, but there's a scene in the movie where there's this like uh, rowing the boats. There's this these guys uh, in the in the rowing of the galley of the boat under underneath, and these were these were the people who were providing the power to the boat. They were providing the manpower to the boat to help it to move forward, but nobody knew what their faces looked like. They're doing their work anonymously, behind the scenes, but their work is important. They were completely anonymous, but they're serving their hearts out. You see, this, this thing that, we're, that we do on Sunday mornings and with our life groups and with our growth track and with our dream team, it's not about our church. It's not about brianmosley.com. It's not about all these things. No, it's, it's about making Jesus famous in our city. Making Jesus famous in our land. It's all about lifting him up. It's all about... Uh, lifting up his name and glorifying him and magnifying him. And the principle behind this word is, is this. It goes along with this. We magnify Jesus, not us. We magnify him, not me. So let's put it all together. Just give you a simple definition of, of uh, who a servant is. Okay, A servant is someone who makes a lifetime commitment to serve people's needs in such a way that magnifies Jesus, not me. Okay? <clears throat> a servant is someone who, who um, makes a lifetime commitment to serve other people's needs in such a way that magnifies Jesus, not me. Now, here's, here's what the servant-hearted do. I just listed out four things. There's a lot more, but... Let me give you four thoughts here about what, is, what the servant-hearted people do. Number one, a servant puts service over status. A servant puts service over status. We see that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where it says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, above uh, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to but each of you to the interests of others. So Jesus set the example, and we should not be any. We're not any greater than Jesus. If he served, then we should be serving, no matter what the capacity, no matter how special we are, no matter our role. If there's a if there's an event. I can tell you this, in our, in our past church in Tennessee, we did several outreach events uh, with our community, and the pa the, our senior pastor would always say, um, all of the pastors on staff, it was a larger church, he would always say, all the, all the pastors in, on staff, I want you to be involved, get your hands dirty in these things, because you're not there just to oversee everything being done, I want you to grab a mop if a floor needs to be cleaned. I want you to grab a broom if some, some sweeping needs to be done. So just because you're a pastor, just because you're this or that, it doesn't mean that you're too good to serve. Amen? Okay. So number two is this. A, a servant puts character over comfort. <clears throat> a servant puts character over comfort. 
think about this as a dad relating to my, to my boys. And if they say, well, Dad, um, I just don't feel like doing my chores today. I just don't feel like doing my homework today. Well, I don't tell them, well, don't worry, son. I just want you to be happy. You can do whatever you want to do just as long as you're happy. Just as long as you're, just be comfortable. Just, just take it easy. Lay on the couch all day. Watch cartoons. It's okay. Just take it easy. No, I'm, I'm a dad, but I, I, I discipline them and I tell them, no, you get your rear end up. And you get your work done, you do your chores, you, do, you take care of your responsibilities and do what you're supposed to do. You need to learn the value of, of hard work and you need to learn the value of character that is doing, doing the right thing. When people are looking or when people are not looking, you do the right thing and you put character over comfort. Teach that with our with our kids, but we also have to realize that God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. Look at Luke chapter ten. There's a story that illustrates this perfectly. Uh, Verse uh, thirty through thirty seven from the Message paraphrase. It says this: There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, they beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side in order to avoid him. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him when he saw the man's condition look at look at these words his heart went out to him he gave him first aid disinfecting and bandaging his wounds then he lifted him onto his donkey led him to an inn and made him comfortable in the morning he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper saying take good care of him If it costs any more, put it on my bill, and I'll pay you back on my way back. What do you think? Here's here's the point of of the story here. Which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. And Jesus said, yeah. Go and do the same. In other words, the key is to care. The key is to be a servant. The key is to empathize, to put ourselves in the shoes of those in need, to actually care for those in need because there's a lot at stake. Now, think, of, think about this. Martin Luther King preached a, an, an incredible message about this passage one time, and he brought out two questions that we just want us to think about today. The first one is this. The priest and the Levite ask the wrong question. They ask, if I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? What's it going to cost me? What am I going to have to sacrifice? What what is this going to inconvenience me? The second question is like it, but but completely opposite. And this is the right question. And we ask, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Right? You see the difference? One is concerned about me, myself, and I. The other one is concerned about what's going to happen to this person in need. What's at stake here? When I think about that, I, I ask myself, just related to what I shared with you guys earlier about adding the second service and stuff, and like how, how in the world can we sit in this room week after week with thousands of people just living in a, in a five or six mile radius of where we're located who do not know Jesus and we just do nothing about it. It's not okay. It breaks my heart. 
I don't know, I'm not saying that we're not, we're not going to do anything about it because I believe that we will step up and we will do something about it. But our passion and the passion of God is we got to help people to know Jesus. We got to help people to come to a saving knowledge of who he is and to be able to discover what freedom in Christ is all about and help people to discover their purpose and get plugged in and make a difference in this world. That's what we want to do. But listen, guys, we will never reach a harvest that we do not see and do not care about. Number three is this. You love me, don't you? Okay, I love you. I love you, too. Number three is this. A servant puts we over me. This is what a servant hearted person does. Now, have you ever thought about that idea, you know, if you want something done right, you just got to do it. Okay, that's wrong. Okay? It's a lie. It's a myth. No, if you want something done right in the kingdom, you do it as a team. You do it together with other people. Well, Pastor Brian, I just want to do my own personal thing. I just want to give to my own pet charities. Um, I just want to volunteer for my personal uh, special cause. Well, guess what, friends? I love you, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Think about it. Look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 45. All the believers were what? Together. together. They're in this thing together. And they had everything in common they even sold property and possessions to to do what to give to be generous to be servants to give to anyone who had a need so i just want to encourage you guys find a we in other words find a team to get into if you're here a part of this church we are volunteers it's called the dream team because it's about serving god's team if it's not here, find a church that you love and you believe in and just go find a group of people that you can connect with and serve God together with and join that team. But whatever you do, don't do this thing by yourself. Join with other people. Give with other people. Serve with other people and find a we and get away from this just me, my own, and I'm just going to do me and I don't care what everybody else does. Okay, the Bible teaches that we do things together and we have things in common. Now, um, the fourth point, I'm going to give you the scripture before I give you the blank. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and invite uh, Chris to come back up. Um, But in Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse uh, 31, this part is not in your notes, but just follow along on the screen. It says this, when the son of man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the goats, he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those, on his right, come, you who are, who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Look at this. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. For I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger to you, but you invited me in. I needed clothes. And you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Now verse 37, this is in your notes. It's what I want you to see today. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? And when did we feed you? Or thirsty and we gave you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in? 
or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Whatever you did for the least of these. Jesus said, that is what you did for me. What Jesus is saying here is this is what real worship is all about. This is what being a Christian is all about. It's like he's saying, church, I love your singing. I love your music. I love your worship. I love the preaching of the word. I love the faithfulness of, of the preaching and teaching. And I like your generosity. I love when you get excited about giving and tithing and your offerings. And I like you when I love it when you believe God for miracles, when you believe God for healing in people's lives. But if you really want to worship me, you will love the people that I love. You will become a servant with a servant's heart. That's what worship is all about. That's what following Jesus is all about. That's the reason that we've been set free. That's the reason we're blessed in order that we can be a blessing to other people. So here's the blank. A servant puts worship over wealth. A servant puts the worship of God over accumulating anything in this earthly world. So my prayer today is that we would be a church committed to be servants, committed to have servant hearts and committed to just saying, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, my answer in advance to you, Lord, is yes. Would you stand with me, please?